Well, this weekend, Laura and I have had family visiting in from out of town. And uh, that means that last night we got to go on a date night. Laura would be glad for me to do that. And uh, it was going great, man. Laura's amazing. We had some wonderful time together. And towards the very end of the date night, we were starting to wrap things up, still enjoying some good time together. We get a call from Grandpa saying that one of our kids, who shall remain nameless, got sick all over the, the rug. Let's say he got sick, okay? And we're like, man. And I'll, I'll tell you, the first thing I thought was, they'll take care of it. <laughs> That's the first thing I thought. And Laura's like, no, we need to go. I was like, yeah, you, we need to go. We need to go home. So we headed home. And we got there and uh, tried to help clean stuff up. And it wasn't long until I started feeling sick. And then Grandpa got sick. And I was up about every half hour in the middle of the night taking care of the various types of sick messes that happen with little kids. I guess I was at least glad that Bethany is sharing with her brother these days. That's always nice to know. But he got really sick this morning. It was one of those long, long nights. Grandpa's even trying to figure out a way to get out of town early now and, and get a better flight home. And so if I haven't said hi to you this morning, if I have not been my usual bubbly, warm self and, and greeting and shaking hands, uh, that's probably why, okay? I'm, I'm trying to, for your sake, no handshakes, no touching. And so if I've seen you in the hallway and looked down, it's probably that, or I don't like you, but prob- probably that I'm, that I'm sick. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneak out right after. But I'll tell you, last night, I was up all night long. We've all had those, those nights where we're sick, all that, we're feeling terrible. You want to call in sick to, to work the next day kind of thing. And I was thinking, man, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to wake up. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, uh, to do this. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to preach through this. And I was about to call Aaron or Benjamin and Bradley, some of the, one of their pastors at the church, and say, I'm going to have to offload this sermon to you. I've got all the notes, got everything. And by God's grace, I am confident that these guys would have been a blessing if they would have done that. But I refused because I was jealous to preach this passage for you. We're in Ephesians chapter 6 today, and we've been there for a little bit. Uh, We're at almost exactly one year of our time in Ephesians. We've been slowly looking through it, a verse at a time, and we've gotten to Ephesians chapter 6, the particular part of this awesome letter that we look to for the armor of God. I love talking about this. I love pointing to it. And the reason that I was so jealous to make sure that no matter what, I'd get up and if I had to preach with a bucket next to me, I was coming because I was so eager to try to equip you for the battle that you may have to face this week. And just to give you an insight into the way that Rich's mind tends to think, I thought to myself, Rich, do you feel differently this week than you did last week? And I said, no, Rich, I, I don't. And I realized that I always feel that way. I always want to get up here and share the word with you and, and, and equip you and help you. And the reason is because today in a passage that's going to help equip us and prepare us for spiritual battle, while we talk about that topic very specifically, all of the sermons are designed to prepare you for spiritual battle. All of them are designed to equip you with truth, give you a taste of the goodness of God that you would want him more than anything else. So I'm eager to preach this for you today. Last week, we covered the first three pieces of armor of six that the Apostle Paul is going to walk through with us. So I want to go ahead and do this. I'm going to read through verses 10 through 20, and then we're going to be in verses 16 through 20 today. So I'm going to read through 10 through 20, and I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go back through those verses one at a time, the last three pieces of armor that are mentioned in this passage, and we're going to ask that God will help us gain as much as we can out of this passage. Let's do that. If you have your Bibles, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. 
To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we look through this passage that millions of Christians have read over thousands of years of church history, we we are asking from you what our brothers and sisters over the centuries have asked. God, serve us well with this. Equip us. Today we need for you to help, help us put on these pieces of armor, to take the battle seriously, to be prepared for the war that's ahead of us, the war that we're facing today, this last week. God, I pray that as we walk through this passage, you'd help me be true, clear, and helpful to those who will ever hear this, that you would be honored, and that this would be a great service to the people of God who love you and are aching to have victory in spiritual battle. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Back to verse 16. That's kind of where we're going to start for today. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, so far in this passage, we've already seen introduced that the enemy, the schemes of the devil, are what are situated against us. That's the offensive attack against us. And we need to be prepared to face these attacks. It's probably not unlikely that if you've ever been in a situation where you're, you're, you're just dealing with spiritual struggle, you may even sense, have an idea that, man, there's something bigger at play here than just the flesh. I know that we have amongst us today a handful of people who are in from out of town doing evangelism and sharing the gospel all over. Did you ever get into a conversation with someone where you're like, this is so clear, it's so obvious. How can a person not see this truth? That's because they've been spiritually blinded. The God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbeliever. This is the way that we deal with the battle. But it's not just out there. It's not just that when we engage in evangelism or when we're talking to non-believing people, that that's when we're going to have to deal with the enemy. That's what we're going to have to deal with this battle. It literally rages within us. It's something that we're going to have to be prepared to deal with on a daily basis. The first three pieces of armor were designed to help give us the defensive pieces necessary in order to ward off the enemy's attack. And here we get to the shield of faith. And Paul introduces this particular piece of armor by saying, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. In all circumstances. You wouldn't even think of going to battle without a shield, without some kind of armor. It could be used for offense or defense. In fact, warriors throughout the ages have known that's what you could use a shield for. But it's a fundamental piece of gear. So fundamental that Paul actually attaches it to something critical of the Christian life. Faith. In all circumstances, take up the shield. The shield of what? Faith. I was looking at other passages in the New Testament that tell us about how our faith overcomes dark forces. The evil one helps us in spiritual battle. I thought this one might be helpful for you. 1 John 5, 4 says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. This is fundamental to us winning battles. And what does this shield of faith do? What what does Paul say about it right here? He says that use this shield with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, shields in the ancient world were commonly made of wood and wrapped with leather. And this leather could be soaked in water so that flaming arrows, when they're coming in, would not only be repelled from hitting the person, but they'd actually be extinguished by the kind of wet leather. Paul expected that you and I would be fired upon from the enemy. This makes you think about kind of a, the way we think of fight and warfare and stuff. There's, there's this kind of dignity in past warfare and battle that there's, there's a sense of humanity almost that makes its way in, even in, even in crazy situations. The kind of honor that the enemy doesn't have. I thought of one really good example of this is World War I. I'm not sure if you've ever read about this, but it's what's called the Christmas Truce. In the early, the first year of World War I, I mean, the, the Germans are fighting against the French and the British, and they got all their, they're already digging all their, uh, their tunnels, and they're trying to uh, ward off the enemy. And uh, there was a point at which, just a few months into the war, Christmas time came, and they had a truce, literally, where the same guys who were firing bullets at each other, throwing grenades at each other one day prior, got out in many cases, were like uh, exchanging cigarettes together. One guy, there's even a, a story about one guy sh- uh, cutting the long hair of a German soldier because he was a... He was a barber, and he saw, he said, you need a haircut. Let me give you one. Uh, they, they, played, they played soccer there together. 
It was just amazing. Like people said that I would never have believed this could happen if I wasn't there to have observed it. Our enemy, the devil, will not give us any kind of humanity. You think about that. He's going to go after us with whatever he has. He's not, going to, he's not going to relent. You think about the way that we even see demonic warfare, spiritual warfare playing out in the Bible. It's oftentimes children that are attacked by these demons. This is not the way that the enemy is. We'll give them a fair fight. There will never be a fair fight. The enemy is constantly going to try to go after you when you're the weakest, when you're tired or, or worn down or when you just have had a, a terrible week or something goes on in your life. When he sees an opportunity, he wants to get in. It's the way that the enemy works. This is why we, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, carry it with you wherever you go, that you'd be ready to ward off these darts being shot in from over the battlefield. You defeat these kind of attacks with faith. I think that in Utah, it's easy sometimes for Christians to overemphasize our need for testable proofs of the gospel. Mormonism is largely void of these establishing evidences that validate its claims. In fact, that's one of the things when people visiting team again, you might notice when you're trying to share the gospel and look at historical things or what the Bible says, it's so, it seems so clear. And it's so wonderful for Christians. We're not afraid of truth. We love truth. We are truth seekers. We chase it down. We, 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 we can be the kind who are over in, in Israel and we, we find a tomb and there's an inscription on it. We're like, what's, what's behind this tomb? Let's, let's see what it is. We can open that with total boldness. Let's find out what the truth is. What's behind that door? It's the way that Christians get to operate. Sometimes I forget this, but I need to be reminded often about, I was growing up in a Christian household and even while I, while I, didn't, while I didn't seize that faith for myself until later in life. I was given such a firm foundation and I was constantly told by my parents, I want you to challenge these things. I want you to test this. I want you to find truth. I want you to seek it. Imagine growing up in a home where you were never told that. You're told, don't doubt, don't doubt, don't doubt. If you have a doubt, just crush it. Just push it away. Push it away. Stick it on a shelf. We are so blessed. But I think that sometimes when we deal with people who have not had those types of experiences, it's very easy for us to overemphasize the evidences, thereby underemphasizing faith. Pick up the shield of faith. The danger, I think, here is that if we lean only on that, we're, we're going to forsake some of the most critical things. It's, for by grace you have been saved by tons of knowledgeable facts. No, no, no. For by grace you have been saved through faith. At the end of the day, you must believe. Jesus was approached by a whole group of people in John 6. Verse 28, they say, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God, to believe in him whom he has sent. We are told this over and over again. Think of Jesus when he, when he sees doubting Thomas after he's been resurrected. And, and Do- Thomas is the only one of the disciples who hasn't seen Jesus yet physically after he's been raised. He's like, I, I, I know you guys all think you've seen him. I won't believe it till I touch him. And he sees Jesus and he does. And Jesus lets him put his fingers in his side and in his hands. And Jesus says to him in John 20, 29, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I think it's important for us to acknowledge that sometimes, how important it is. The day's going to come, you're not going to have all the facts at your disposal. You're not. And what are you going to do? Rely on faith. And that's okay. It's good. Ephesians 6 continues on. Verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's do the helmet. The helmet of salvation. What does it mean to take the helmet of salvation? Aren't we already saved? Like, does this mean, like, get saved? Go get saved so you can fight spiritual battles. No, I, I don't think that's what it means. It's not to get saved, but it's to acknowledge the means of our salvation, the grace of God. You are not going to win these battles that you're going to face purely on your own strength, your own merit. I said this last week. I said, remember, you didn't get saved by your own power, and you can't expect to live out your Christian life merely by your own power. Putting on the helmet of salvation is acknowledging how it is that you can even be saved. I, I was thinking about Old Testament example of this. King David, before he actually became the king, he was anointed to become the king by Samuel, a prophet. He's a true prophet of God who said, you will be a king. Not only that, but the current king at that time, Saul, had said, you're going to be the king. Jonathan, Saul's son, is like, hey, you're going to be king someday. 
Everyone knew this guy was going to be king. No matter where he went, the Philistines knew he was going to be king. Everyone knew it. And yet David, more than almost any other Old Testament author, cries out to God, Woe to me, God! Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? I'm going to die. My, my, my enemies surround me. And he cries out to God. He cries out for salvation. Why? Because even though his kingship had been secured in those moments of heated battle, he needed to be reminded that you're the one who's going to save me. You're going to do this. You're going to bring me out of this. I don't know how, but you have to. You have to because of what you've promised. You and I need to put on the helmet of salvation. What would be the opposite? Think about it. If you're having a hard time figuring, what's it like putting it on? What's the opposite of putting on the helmet of salvation? That would be to forsake your salvation. That would be to disregard the way that you were actually saved. As a believer, you need to be reminded by the gospel. This is why believers, we don't show up to Easter services like, well, they're going to do the gospel one again. So we don't have to go to that one because we know that one. Right? You you need to be washed by it. You need to hear it over and over again. You need to be reminded of how it is that you were saved. Not by works done by you in righteousness, but by faith in God. By grace, you have been saved through faith. This is what... Paul's already said earlier in the book, you need to be reminded by the gospel. Take up the helmet of salvation and and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, many have noted that the sword is the only explicitly offensive weapon in this list of armor, and that's true. But it is also notable that Jesus wielded Scripture all the time. He, he could speak, and it would be word of God. And yet he wielded Old Testament passages, words, written, scripture, in order to deal with his enemies, most notably at the point of his temptation. There was a point where Jesus was actually confronted by Satan, tempted by Satan. Consequently, Satan was trying to twist scripture and use that against Jesus. Why? Because that's the weapon. And Jesus used scripture to deal with Satan. He could have said anything, but he used truth previously declared. I, I, I love this verse, Hebrews 4.12. It's one of those helpful ones, good to memorize. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's a lot of stuff. The Bible is a useful tool. It is the weapon that we utilize in engaging our enemy. This is why knowing Scripture is so important to us. I grew up in a, in a church where I, when I was a little kid, we used to do sword drills. You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? Hold the Bible up like this, and then the teacher would say, Ephesians 5, 3. And everybody would go like this, and you try to find it as fast as you could. And the idea was just Bible familiarity. Oh, it was awesome. I think that's so cool. I got those little tabs on it one time, and they called me a cheater. And I was like, hey, man, I'm just getting ready for battle. That's on you. <laughs> getting to know your Bible. It's like practicing with a weapon. I was in the Marines, and they, they issued us each a rifle, and we were given a very specific one. We had to memorize the, the serial number on it. We had to get to know how to utilize it. We had to know where every little crack and dent and stuff had, it, it was on it. We had to really get to know it. The idea was that the more you got to know your individual weapon, the more prepared you were to deal with it in battle. That was the whole point of it. But unlike any other weapon, you don't sharpen the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit sharpens you. you, you You don't take it and try to tweak the Bible to fit your argumentation. You don't take the Bible and try to make it, to massage it into making it, it fit in your schema, in your worldview, something you want to believe. The, the word shapes you. That's how it's supposed to work. For the record, if you're spending time in the Bible regularly, you should be proved incorrect all the time. You should be constantly finding places where you're like, I thought that. But this says this. And align yourself to that. If anyone were to poke their head inside our office, Bradley and I have put up a giant, like a Romans, the entire book of Romans is to cover an entire wall there. It looks like a serial killer's basement or something, right? Like circles and scribbles and stuff like this. And uh, we were going through some passages, just every once in a while we need to take a quick, quick break from something, we just, we just dive into Romans and just start going through some parts and pieces there together. Whip out the pens and markers and highlighters and all the good stuff. 
And it was last week, and I, 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 I had been, or a couple weeks ago actually now, and I had been, uh, I probably read through this one very specific passage of Romans like 200 times, over and over and over in my life, just constantly walking through. And I was pretty convinced that w- what one word meant. And he was like, no, I don't think it means that. I was like, yes, it does. I, I, here, let me show you. I walked through, and we went through, like, word for word, sentence by sentence, all the way to the end. And by the time I got to the end, I proved myself wrong. I was like, oh. And I'll be really honest with you. Bradley, for those of you who don't know, Bradley's the younger pastor in training here and stuff, and so I'm the sage, the wise sage. I'm the Yoda, trying to coach and train him. And all the fleshly desires in me wanted to be like, and that's why my view's right. (laughs) But I was... Oh, it was so humbling, and it was so good. When you spend time in the Bible, and you, you let it be your authority, you say, this is authority, this is king over me. This Bible tells me what to believe, not the other way around. And you're going to do that. It's going, to, it's going to sharpen you, which is unlike any other sword. This is sort of the spirit. I highly encourage that. Soldiers train with their weapons, but they also train without them, Right? What if you drop your rifle in battle? What if you drop your sword? You don't just go, time out, time out, time out, time out, dropped it. Okay, you don't? It doesn't go down like that in battle, right? What? Hand-to-hand combat. How are you going to deal with things if you lost your weapon, if it got blown up or whatever, something happened? You know, I've always in my mind thought of hand-to-hand combat as scripture memorization. Like when you don't have your Bible right there to whoosh, wield it. And you have, you have one stored in your mind. You press deep into your mind and deep down into your heart. You, you, you draw those out on your lips and you go, no, but the Bible says, and you can, you can draw those things out. Oh, if you don't have a physical Bible, first of all, you probably do if you have a phone. My goodness, you, you, you have access to a Bible everywhere you go. But if you don't, for some reason, have access to a physical Bible where you are, this is one of the reasons you just press truth and memorize it into yourselves. Why? Because you might be standing in front of somebody one day and they're going to be asking you, hey, so what about this one thing? Or they're going to challenge you on something and you're going to want to recall a truth. You're going to want to recall a verse. And you're going to feel really compelled to not misquote it or, or say it's in the wrong location where you forget the reference or something. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been like, well, the Bible says um, d- uh, don't, uh, d- don't, it says you shouldn't sin, and uh, it's in there, trust me, just, just trust me. You ever been in that situation and been like, man, I have to remember where that is. So the next time I talk with somebody, the next time I'm in that place, or I'm feeling a doubt of some area, and I need to be reminded by truth that it will just bubble out of me. We want to get to know the Bible. We want it to sharpen us. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The sword may be the only piece of equipment designed explicitly for offense, but it is not our only means of attack. Look at the next verse. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. While your, your, your sword of the Spirit is an offensive weapon, it's not the only way to attack. God has given you prayer. No matter where you are, no matter what situation you find yourself in, we are told to pray at all times in the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Do you do anything without ceasing? I mean, like heart beating, you breathe, that kind of stuff. You know, involuntary actions might take place. Your thoughts, you can't just stop your thoughts, that kind of stuff. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? To pray at all times in the Spirit. That's a continual day in life of prayer. That's a wherever you're going. You're, you're being mindful of the thoughts of God. You're asking for Him to be part of every part of your life. You know what WhatsApp is, that little app that you put on the phone? At our church here, we do a whole bunch of people have started all different theology chats and ministry to Mormons chats and all kinds of stuff like this, and we just we communicate a lot through there. And it's really common that I'll, I'll be doing some Bible study in the morning and something I'm going through like really jumps out to me and I'll start feverishly you know, typing out these, oh, what about this? Check out this. What do you guys think about this? Have you seen something else? What, you know, throw out some ideas and everybody will start responding back. And eventually it'll get late enough in the morning that people will start saying, hey, I got to go to work, bowing out. I'll check in later. I'm like, come on, man, right in the middle of this thing. <laughs> We're still going and you know, people will say, sorry, I've got to log off for right now. Man, it's just so amazing to me. God never signs off. There's no point in which God's like, okay, uh, 
our conversation is closed for now. It's time out. Don't worry. We'll talk again later. It never works that way for God. Is, it, is that not mind-blowing to you? That the God of the universe isn't too busy to be dealing, interacting with you every minute of every day. Isn't that awesome? That he's not just spending time with the holiest one of us on this earth or the highest in the hierarchical system of religion. God is present and there with us wherever we are. We can talk with him all the time. Pray at all times in the Spirit. That's how we're to pray. How? In the Spirit. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Why don't you look at Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. A praying in the Spirit is an acknowledging of the Spirit of God that dwells within us, literally bringing our needs before our Father in heaven. It means to rely on the Spirit of God that we have been given. I couldn't help but think of uh, James. For those of you who might be remembering Scripture, just have some of that stuff floating around in your mind. What does James say? Um, is effective for a righteous man. It's the prayer of a righteous man is effective. Why? Not because there's something unique or special about the individual that he's got some kind of gift. He wields it like Harry Potter's wand. But because in the Spirit, we approach our God. We deal with our God. The Spirit is God. We, We literally can relate to, get help from, Talk to God all day. We are also to keep alert. You might have noticed there that verse, six, uh, verse 18. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Keep alert. This means to stay vigilant. Stay ready, prepared. Even the greatest warrior can be defeated when he's caught off guard. Now, I was thinking about Samson. He's an Old Testament prophet who got himself in a whole bunch of trouble. He could literally defeat an army by himself and the job one of the donkey, for one, one, one example. Literally. And he was destroyed. How? How in the world does it happen to a guy? Because he was caught off guard. He was lulled to sleep by his own lustful heart. He did not keep alert. He wasn't prepped and ready for battle at any time. It doesn't matter how tough you are, how strong you are. Let me be watchful. Be ready for the battle. Making supplication for all the saints. That's the last half of the last part of verse 18. Make making supplication for all the saints. Supplication, there's a dictionary definition of that is the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. It's going to God and asking God, asking something for God to provide. For what? What are we to ask God for in regards of our fellow saints? One example is given in the very next verse, verse 19 through 20. And also for me, Paul's, Paul's saying this, pray, uh, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. He's an ambassador in chains. He's he's literally been imprisoned for the gospel. In fact, the mystery of the gospel word here, we we dealt with this multiple times in previous chapters, this idea that that Jew and Gentile, so distinct throughout the history of even the Old Testament time periods in so many people's eyes, were were to be united, the dividing wall of hostility, be broken down in Jesus Christ, making one man here and one man here into a new one man. Earlier, the book of Ephesians tells us that's the mystery of the gospel. And that's what he's doing. He's proclaiming these things. He's saying, I need help. That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. He asks for boldness in preaching. Now, does Paul strike you as the kind of guy who struggles with boldness? You know? He's like, hey, pray that I'll be bold. Paul, uh, I think you got that part covered. No. He's like, pray that that persists, that that continues. I need you putting on your armor and then praying for me over here as I'm putting on my armor because I'm going to go back out and I'm going to need your prayers. We need each other. Man, I've said this 
so many times, and I'll just keep repeating it for as long as I'm a pastor, there are no spiritual Rambos. I'm tough, I can do it myself. No, you can't. You should not even try. You need a prayer posse. You need people who get around you and say, Man, I'll be with you, I'll pray for you. You guys know the prayer warrior types in your life? The ones who will never turn down prayer for you. They'll always do it. They'll do it without asking. You need to, you need to get prayer warriors around you. And you, and you need to commit to being a prayer warrior, a kind of person who says, man, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to write this down. I'm going to put a little, little reminder on my phone to text me so I'm so absent-minded I might forget, but it, it'll pop through and I'll go, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be praying for that thing, for that person. And we lift those things up for one another. This is one of the things that's so beautiful about Christian life, Christian living. It's just, it's better than anything else when it comes to relationships in this world. When you're in a fighting hole, a foxhole, if you're, if you're getting ready to go to battle, you don't care if the person next to you is rich or poor, or if he's kind of nerdy, or if he's the cool A squad kind of character. You don't care old or young. You, you, really, you don't care black or white or purple. You just want that warrior to cover your six, to be there, to fight with you, to be willing to die for you as you are willing to die for him. You don't find this anywhere nearly as pure as you can find it in the Christian life. And it's amazing because we are united by the Spirit of God. The same Spirit that dwells in me as a believer dwells in my brother as a believer. We literally are united in a way that no one else can be. When we pray for one another, Holy Spirit doesn't go, wait, who is that? Who, who are you asking for help for? He's literally present with the person you are praying for at that time. Here's, here's what I want to do. We got, we got through this, this portion right here. And I, I want to just give you a bit of a major implication that's really clear. Hopefully it should have been made clear by now. I want to I drill that deep. And then I want to end with some hopeful encouragements for you. This is the major implication that hopefully you're seeing. The Christian life is a battle. You need to expect war. I get so frustrated. I get so furious in heart when I think about the lie of the prosperity gospel that is deceiving people all around the world. Become a Christian and everything will go well for you. What? You do this in the New Testament and put your finger down anywhere, anywhere. And within those nearby paragraphs, that'll prove that wrong. My goodness, we are promised battle. We are, we are made sure war is coming. Put on, the, put on the armor. It's not put on the flip-flops and the, the towel around your waist and sit on a little, what do you sit on when you go to a beach? I don't even go to beaches, I don't know. It's not that thing. It's, it's, not, it's not cruise ship life. It's battle. It's war. We like to say that when you get born again, you're born onto a battlefield. In fact, for many people, that's where life literally begins as a war. Romans 7, 21 through 24. I want to show this because it's one of the places that I think Paul, same author as, Romans, as Ephesians here, is going to use a similar kind of language and he's going to explicitly pin it to war that's ever-present reality in the life of a believer. He says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I've become pretty convinced this is talking about the believing life the believer after being saved. And the reason I think this is because literally several, it's a paragraph and a half later, it says this. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. You're going to have a waging war kind of reality and it's going to be a daily thing for you. And we have hope. We have hope because Christ is in you. And while your body is going to war, it's going to want certain things, your, your spirit, awakened, made alive in you, given to you at the point of regeneration, there's going to be, there's going to be a constant conflict there. So here's some encouragement for the Christian regarding battle. First, are you experiencing peace? I'm willing to bet that there are some out there who might think, like, man, things are going pretty well right now. Like, Bible time's great, man. I'm thinking about the thoughts of God all the time. I just, 
I love praying for people. I just, things are going really well spiritually for me. Amen. Praise God for that. Praise the Lord for that. But what does the warrior do during times of peace? He trains. Right? If you're in a, a season of peace, amen, you, you may have some of those, those, those seasons of sanctuary where God is just giving you sweet, sweet blessing, and you're just going, man, life is amazing. Use that time to train. Prepare yourself. Be a help to the brother and sister to your right and your left who are in battle right now, and get yourself ready because it will likely come soon. And I know some of you might be discouraged because you feel as though you've been losing battles for a long time. The reason I feel confident to say this is because I talk to you. This is the kind of language that many believers talk about. Man, I feel like in this one particular area or within this one particular relationship, I just I feel like I've been losing every time I step on the battlefield for weeks or months or sometimes maybe years. I want... I want you to take this as an encouragement. You need to expect a lifetime of war. Yeah, you you may have seasons of peace. There may be some blessing moments where you just get some relief. That, That could happen. But those usually don't last very long. And sanctification is not microwavable. You don't just you don't just get there fast. It's not gonna take place in a day. It's gonna go on until you're made perfect. And you and I both know that you're not there. And you won't be. You won't be until you see Jesus face to face. You know, just to confide for a moment, for for me, this is is the way that I, I struggle when I deal with enduring seasons of struggle. Enduring seasons that feel like, man, I feel like I'm losing. When those go on for a long time, when I start feeling weary from the battle, like, man, I just why can't I beat this one? Personally, I distract myself. That's my error. I keep myself busy with things that don't matter. In other words, I just pretend the war is not raging. It's so wearisome. It's so exhausting. Isn't it better to just go, let's just pretend it's not raging. Let's just, just distract myself. I don't know if that's you. But I'm saying this in case it is, and it could be helpful for you. You know, I, I think that in those moments, sometimes personally for myself, I just need to let myself sit in silence and let the fight begin. Let the war rage on. In fact, you know what that is? The distraction is the battle. That is the battle. It's not that I shut it out. It's actually there, and it's winning. The enemy is winning with those things that take our eyes off of Christ, that take our minds off of higher things, that take our heart away from greatest affection given to God. I think this happens all over the place, and I think this is a really common one for Americans. We get lulled into sleep because we are so well-blessed. We don't even know what to argue about. We have to invent things. Even Christians sometimes, I think, struggle with this. We let ourselves get distracted by the things of the world, by the things that are around us, rather than standing up and fighting the battle. And we need to never forget that there is a purpose for war. If you ever ask yourself, why did God design it this way? Like, why didn't he just make it that at the point of a person's conversion, like right then, boom, joy, happiness, blessing, all that stuff, just... Uh, so the spiritual growth scale, why not get saved, boom, go see Jesus? Why not? Why didn't he do that? He could have. I want you to consider for a moment, God is glorified in your battle. He's glorified in your fight. Not in the fact that you don't have to fight, but in the fact that you do. Remember Job in the Old Testament? God didn't say to Satan, hey, leave Job alone. Everything's going great for him because he loves me. He provoked Satan to go down there and mess with Job. Like, literally. Why? God gets glory. I want you to look at this real quick. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. This is, this is Paul writing about the struggles that he'd had to endure in his missionary journey. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. So what was Paul's struggle here? Uh, Probably, certainly receiving all kinds of persecution, but that's not the thing he's pointing out. 
The feeling of the sentence of death is what he's talking about. We felt we'd received the sentence of death. We despaired of life itself. You know what despair is? That joy-robbing depression that presses deep into the soul makes you wish that you were dead. (laughs) And Paul's answer, what he says coming out of this is, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You want to be dead? God raises the dead. And sometimes he brings those battles right to your front door. There are a dozen really great verses like this in the New Testament that I was compelled to go to. I just want to land here as we conclude. God may intend for that battle that you're facing right now not only to turn you into the new creation. You already are a new creation and being made into one. It's kind of the way the New Testament talks about the Christian life. But not just for your sake that you would have growth, but God gets glory in what's happening in you. When we acknowledge that even in the struggle, even in the despair of life itself, that was intentional, there was a purpose to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. That's a beautiful truth. There is such hope. If you struggle with depression or despair and are wondering, why would God allow this weight to sit on me? Maybe to teach you to give God glory through acknowledging that you are not enough. And we say to people sometimes, come to Jesus and you'll have peace. And that's true. You will. You'll have peace with God. But peace with God means war with all of his enemies. And the only way to peace is through the battlefield. You can have it. But not yet. This life is a mist. It's a breath, a blink. It's, it vanishes in an instant. But eternity, eternity is the time for our final rest. And we're not there yet. So to the believer, be encouraged. This life, this struggle, this spiritual battlefield is the closest to hell that you will ever get. I want to close by reading this encouragement for you in Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Oh Lord, you are good. And my heart hurts this morning because I know there are so many people today who weep and despair and struggle daily. And Father, I know that when those struggles produce harmful doubt and when those struggles cause us to take our eye off of you and when those struggles rob affection in our hearts for you, Satan laughs. I just pray, Lord, I pray you'd help those who are fighting the battles to be reminded that they are given the Spirit of God, that they are equipped with these pieces of armor that don't belong to them. They belong to you. But you equip us. And you've given us each other. And mostly you've given us yourself. And Lord, please remind us when we need this reminder that victory doesn't mean no war in this life. But the victory secured at the cross of Jesus means eternal life for us. It means that he will certainly preserve us, that we will win this war, that we will make it to the end. Father, I pray that as uh, people are struggling through how to deal with the various things that we all have to deal with, uh, that we would not think for a moment that we should deal with them alone. Father, help us to become the kind of believers who in great humility and love and generosity and benefit of the doubt to one another are eager to suffer for the sake of our hurting brothers and sisters. That, Lord, the day that we are struggling and suffering, that we may be given relief through your church. So, Lord, today I ask for relief and help. And, Lord, if it is in your will to persist and to press into the battle in the hearts of some people whom we love, that you would give us the ability to see beyond this immediate battle 
and see eternity where all battles have ceased, where we have finally found a place where we can see you face to face, where we can have rest for our weary souls for eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.